Our scripture this morning is from Galatians 5, 15, uh, 13 through 15, and Matthew 5, 38 to 48. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the fl flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Matthew 5, 38 to 40. You have, heard it, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what, re what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Thank you, Ellen. There is this movie, um, I don't know, it was made in the 90s, I believe, that captured my heart and soul. And it captured my heart and soul um, for one main reason. It's called Hope Floats, and it's kind of a Southern movie, so it's not really because it's Southern, because I didn't grow up in the South, but it captured my heart and soul because of a little girl in this movie. And there's a little girl in this movie who desperately loves her father, and this little girl's father leaves the family. And there's a scene in this movie when the father leaves that is desperately difficult to watch, especially if you are somebody who has had their father leave them. My father left my family when I was five years old, and I loved my father so much. I can't even describe to you the love that I have for my father, and I don't know where this love came from because I don't have very many memories of my father. I just know that the love that I have for this man that there's barely a picture of is deep and it is wide and it is everything. And when I first saw this movie and I first saw this little girl chasing a car down the street, screaming her daddy's name, begging him not to leave, I identified with every ounce of who that little girl was. I knew her feelings. And for the first time in my entire life, I think I finally understood or I saw somebody reflect to me what I felt. And the thing is, from the moment that that happened to me in my life, because I, in that time, saw it as something that happened to me, I learned that things are scarce in this world, that there's only so much of things in this world. There's only so much 
of a father's love to go around. There's only so much of a mother's love to go around because when you're a single mom, there's only so much of you to give. There's only so many resources in this world. And I think we learn that, all of us, regardless of our circumstances, in one way or another. All of us beg for attention at some point in our life, in some way in our life. We all want to be the one who gets the attention from our parents. We all want something. And as we grow up, we, we tend to learn that this world is a world of limited resources, or we believe that it's a world of limited resources. And because I believed it was a world of limited resources, when I heard that my father had gotten remarried, I hated the woman he got remarried to. I didn't know her, but I hated her with every ounce of every being in my body. But I didn't know her. But she had a resource I didn't have. She had something I wanted that I couldn't have. And so she was evil. And we do that in this world. We polarize everything. You're either on my side or you're not on my side. You're either with me or against me. And because resources are limited, we become very competitive with the ways of this world. And it's interesting, if you think about it, how that happens as we grow up. In school, you compete for grades, you compete for popularity, you compete for sporting championships, you compete for all sorts of things. Then you get into the work world and you compete for jobs or you compete for money, you compete for status, you compete for all sorts of things, but it's all limited resources. There's only so much of it in the world to give. And we become very divisive, very separated. And if you look at the world around us, what you'll see is a very divided world with people on each side of the divided world certain that they are correct. Right? Well, this week, in our third week of John Wesley's Three Simple Rules, we're looking at the rule of doing no harm. We started with describing John Wesley as the man who started the Methodist movement. It wasn't meant to be a separate tradition, a separate religion. He was part of the Anglican Church in England. But as time moved on and after he passed away, it became its own, its own denomination, if you want to call it. And that's who we are, Methodists, because there's a method to what we do and there's very reasonable plans to how we do everything. But that's so we can grow and so we can get closer to God. And John Wesley believed that the way that we become happy in this world, the way that we enjoy this life, the way that we experience true happiness is through our relationship with God. And that true happiness is found only as we love God and as we love our neighbor. And how do we live that out? John Wesley wanted to know, because we can't just like our mission statement, we just don't put it on the wall and say, yeah, it's just going to happen. He wanted to know how you could live that out. And so he found a way to encourage people. And so he gave them three simple rules. The first one, do no harm. The second one, do good. And the third one, attend to the ordinances of God or stay in love with God, which is what we talked about last week because we did communion, which is one of the ordinances of God. So we kind of did it a little backwards. But this week, do no harm. And it seems so simple. Do no harm, when I first heard it, felt like the easiest one of all of them. Because I feel like I go through most of my day doing a lot of no harm. Because if you look at the Ten Commandments, I'm not really murdering people most days. Most days. <laughs> this is the South. There's a lot of bugs. And they are creatures of God. But, you know, most days. Most days, I make it without stealing. I am not a teenager anymore. I mean, most days, we make it through our lives without hitting any of those big things on the top 10, right? We figure if we're not hitting that big list of 10 things, we're doing no harm. 
But the truth is that the real harm that has killed this world, that it is currently killing our society and our relationships in our personal lives, in our homes, in our work environments, has nothing to do with the top 10 and has everything to do with division and divisive behavior and the way that we choose not to love and not to care for those around us. I started with telling you the story about my dad and how I looked at my stepmom afterwards. And here's what we need to understand about doing no harm. Doing no harm is an active, proactive way of living in which you choose to look at every single creation on this earth as if they are as loved by God as you are. Because the truth is, they are. Whether it's somebody that hurts you deeply, because my father hurt me deeply. And as much as I loved him and never really saw him again, I hated him and I hated the people who took me away from him and it killed me. It, I just cannot tell you how much it carried me in my life, that pain. And it affected decisions that I made in my life, that pain. Because I chose to see my father instead of being a creation of God that was broken. I saw him as an enemy, as an opponent, as somebody who took something from me that was due to me. I saw the stepmom that way. I saw the sisters that I never met, that I didn't even really knew existed, but I heard maybe existed. I saw them that way. They were all evil. They were all opponents. And we do this. We do this in our work world. We go to work and somebody disagrees with us. And all of a sudden, I'm here and I'm righteous. And I know what I'm doing and I'm doing it right. And because you disagree with me, we're now opponents. And not only are we opponents, I need to make sure that I'm right. So I might say to Jackie, hey, Jackie, don't you think that so-and-so did that kind of wrong? And then Jackie's like, yeah, I think so-and-so did that kind of wrong. And in one move, not only have I done harm to Jackie, but I've helped somebody else do harm to Jackie. And I've created division between me and Jackie. I've created division between that other person and Jackie. And I'm doing harm upon harm upon harm because I'm hurt. When we hurt, we hurt. You've heard the saying, right? Hurt people hurt people. Well, here's the thing, my friends. We live in a broken world. We are all hurt people. Every single one of us in here have been hurt. Every single one of us in here have been broken. And so we all want to make it right by making sure that there's evil in this world. And so we want to put evil on the side. Look at the Republican and the Democrats. Oh my word. It is the most disgusting thing in my opinion. There is no way in this world that there's ever going to be a way for them to work together. Do you want to know why? Because they're certain they're right, both sides. Not only are they certain they're right, but the other people are not only wrong, but they're evil. They're wrong and they're evil. They're wrong and they're evil. Not only do I not agree with you, but I agree with, disagree with you so much that you are a bad, bad person. But what that person really is, is a creation of God, loved by God, as much as you are. That person who did that terrible thing to you is a creation of God, loved by God, as much as you are. This world wants us to pit each other against each other because it works that way. Evil feeds off of that. And you can see it working all the time. 
And as I was preparing for this sermon, I was convicted so much about the way I talk about the things I don't like in this world. It's okay for me to say I don't like the way that politics works. It is not okay for me to say I don't like that politician. Because you know what? I don't know that stinking politician. And even if I did, guess what? God loves them. God loves them. And me saying I don't like them isn't fixing anything. It's creating division between me and other people. It's it's creating division in this world that's never going to be fixed. Look at our religious societies. Look at 25,000 denominations. Why? Because we disagree on different points of the Bible. Do you think Jesus said, Peter, I'm going to make you the church 25,000 different times? (laughs) My friends... Evil is division, and division happens when we decide that we have to be right, and that in order for us to be right, somebody else has to be wrong. And that's what the world has taught us. Growing up, I don't know how it happened for me, but the first time I remember it was with my, mom, my stepmom and my dad. But in order for me to be right, somebody else has to be wrong. In order for me to get what I want, somebody else has to lose something. We have decided in this world that everything is scarce, but what we have forgotten is that there's nothing scarce about our God. That our God is not limited in this world. Our God is infinitely capable of doing whatever we need to have done. And so in those moments when we feel like we want that we need, that we must say something. What we're really not doing is trusting God. For example, sometimes people say things about you that are utterly false and untrue. And that hurts, doesn't it? And you want to chase around the whole world telling them that what they heard was not true. And not only what they heard was not true, but the person who said it is ugly and evil and awful. But what Jesus tells us in that scripture is not to do that. What does Jesus tell us to do? He says to turn the other cheek. Why? Why is that Jesus' advice? Why? My thoughts are this. God is the only one who controls your destiny. Not somebody else's words about you. And when we fail to trust God and think we have to control the outcome of everything, We lose. And no matter how hard we try, we can't control it anyway. No matter how hard we try, we can't control the outcome of life anyway. People are going to believe what they want to believe. People are going to think what they want to think. People are going to do the things that they're going to do. We cannot control other people. The only person you can control in your life is you. The only behavior you can control in your life is your behavior. The only way we can make this world better is by controlling our mouths, our minds, and our tongues. And if we do that, this world will begin to change because there will be more goodness going around and less evil. The more that I control myself in the midst of a hailstorm of evil, the more goodness will happen. And it's not easy. It is the most radically difficult thing you will ever engage in, this doing no harm thing. I'm telling you right now, it is not easy. But I have worked over my years to engage in this. And I tell you, it has healed some of the hardest relationships in my life. Simply keeping your mouth shut. Shut. 
holding your tongue. Because our God is infinite. Our God knows what the end is going to be. And though we can't feel it, we can't see it, we don't know what the end is going to look like, God does. The pain that was caused to me by the things that happened to me when my dad left. And all of the negative things that I did and the pain that I caused others because of that pain. I can't take that back. But let me tell you how infinite our God is. You see, five years ago, I got to meet that dad again, really for the first time. I saw him when I was five, and then again when I was 40. Something I never thought would happen when I was alive, something that I prayed would happen in heaven, that I would get to heal, that I would get to see him, that I would get to ask all the questions I wanted to ask, that I would get to ask why, that I would get to see this man, I got to do on earth. As a kid, I didn't understand. As a teenager, I didn't understand. And I hurt. And I did harm to others because of the pain that I felt. But as I allow God to heal me, I became a different human being. So that the day that I finally met my father, I could meet him as a whole human, ready to accept him for who he is, a creation of God, loved by God. And it was the most unbelievable thing I've ever experienced in my life. Because God did something I never knew was possible. We think that this world is limited and we have to fight and scrap and make things work for ourselves but we don't. We need to radically trust God. Radically trust God. And choose in the meantime to look at everyone around us and understand that they are a human being with a story, trying to live their story. A human being created by God, loved by God, as much as you are. Can you go and do no harm, creating no division and only loving those around you? Because if you do, the promise is God will take care of the rest. And I got to sit and see that work in my own life. And I promise you the same will be true for you. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the way that you love us. We ask for your mercy in helping us to control our divisive ways, to control the way that we gossip, the way that we want to be right, to control our hurt. Help us, God, to love others the way that you love them, even if we see them as evil. Help us, God, to see this world the way that you see. It's in your name we pray.